third. All right. Let's announce the slot. All right. So we are rocking and rolling in the class. Um, so I, I put this together so that everybody would sort of have a general idea of the game plan between now and our first celebration. So our first celebration is going to be Friday, September 23rd. So we've got homework assignments that are due today, um, Wednesday, and Friday. We do not have a homework assignment due the following Monday because that homework assignment that I'm assigning on Friday, I'm making it due Wednesday. Um, it's a little bit longer. Uh, so what we're going to do on Friday is Friday, I'm going to generally explain sort of the process about which we compute deflections, and then we're going to have a comprehensive example of doing so. This uh, homework that I give you on Friday is going to be the computation of deflections in a truss. Um, while you probably aren't going to be able to finish the homework over the weekend, one piece of advice I would give you over the weekend is to solve that truss, because um, that will make your life a little easier to, to complete the homework assignment. Now, I have sort of technically covered everything that there is to cover about the method of joints, except for one thing. I want to discuss how to handle a particular situation in joint analyses that, that can arise. I want to show you how to do that. And then I want to talk today about how to identify zero force members. Okay. Now, the motivation for what we're going to talk about today with joint analyses, I want to go to the example that we're actually going to look at today uh, and sort of explain it. We're going to do something off to the side real quick to kind of illustrate what's going on. So let's say I give you this truss, and I say I want you to solve this truss using the method of joints. Okay. So uh, can you solve joint B at the very beginning of the problem? No. Can you solve joint C at the very beginning of the problem? No. You could do D or A, right? So let's just pick one. Let's do A. All right, so here's joint A. Oh, let's do that. So here's joint A. There's a member that goes like this and a member that goes like this. Now, these are both diagonals, right? So they have a vertical, horizontal, vertical, horizontal. And then there's a reaction here and a reaction here. Does anybody see the problem with this joint? So how many unknowns do I have in the vertical direction? Too many. Two. I have one too many. What about in the horizontal direction? I have two. Damn, how do I do this, right? Because theory says that I should be able to solve this joint, but practicality tells me that every joint I've solved, I haven't had this problem yet. I would have like a diagonal and then a horizontal, so it would tell me to solve for the vertical force, use the, uh, the vertical first, use the slope ratio to get the other component, and then solve uh, some forces in the x direction. But here I can't do that. I've got too many unknowns in either direction. So I'm kind of stuck. Now there's two ways of going about this. The one way is to actually not use the method of joints, and that's to use the method of sections, to actually cut a section and employ moments. That is an option, okay? Uh, but we haven't gotten to that yet, and I want to illustrate another option using matrix algebra. And I mentioned matrix algebra because it actually becomes relevant to some stuff that we're going to do uh, later this semester. Um, now, this is actually, uh, I know the folks in statics, we actually just started doing this with, um, with uh, uh, particle systems very recently. So it's, uh, uh, for the folks in there, they've kind of seen some of this before, although the context was way different. We're just looking at particle systems here and there, and here we're looking at trusses. But what we're going to do is we're going to uh, utilize two by two systems of equations to solve joints. Okay, and I want this to be another equation or another tool in your toolkit. Uh, and I don't want you to be scared if you've got a situation like this that it's unsolvable because it is. You just need the, the tools to do it. Okay. So again, from a theoretical perspective, there's nothing to say we can't use the method of joints. Um, the method of joints says we're limited to joints with two unknowns, so we should be able to solve that joint. There's nothing that says we shouldn't be able to do it utilizing the method of joints. Let's talk about how. Okay. Now, in order to do that, um, I want to refresh your memory about a fundamental class of problems that you uh, saw when you were a student in algebra. Okay. 
So I've got to believe that everybody remembers at some point being given problems like this. So you're given two equations like x plus 2y equals 3 and 2x plus 3y equals 4, and you are supposed to find that magic set of values for x and y such that it satisfies both equations. It is called solving simultaneous sets of equations. We would call this solving a two-by-two two system of equation because there's two equations, two unknowns. So the goal is to find the value of x that satisfies both equations. Now there are three real practical approaches that we could use to solve this problem. The first two are probably what you're familiar with from Math 127 or Math 130 or Math 132, I'm not sure which class that you uh, did that in, but it's something before Calculus 1, um, or what you did in high school, and that's substitution and elimination. The third is to utilize matrix algebra, and uh, matrix algebra, um, so to put this in perspective, the solution of problems like this, if you've ever, how many of you have heard of linear algebra? That's what that entire science is dedicated towards, is figuring these types of problems out. And that's it. That's the whole class. And so you learn about vectors and vector spaces and, and uh, forms of matrices like row echelon form, reduced row echelon form, all of that geared towards solving systems like this because they show up all the time in science and engineering that it's that important. Okay? But let's go back to basics. Okay? So the first method is substitution. So how does substitution work? So what I do is I take one of those equations and I isolate one of the variables. So I took the first equation, and I'm going to isolate x by moving the 2y over to the other side of the equation. And so I have x equals a pile of junk. And so I take that expression, and I substitute it into the second equation. So instead of x, I put in that pile of junk, 3 minus 2y, and I go through my algebra, I plug and chug, da -da 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 -da, and I solve, and I get y equals 2. Now I've got y equals 2. I can take y equals 2, plug it into either one of the uh, equations, it doesn't matter, and get x is minus 1. And there's my answer, okay? And, and that should be relatively familiar. Has everybody seen that before? It's probably been a while, but I'm sure you've seen it, right? That's substitution. Elimination is to take one of these expressions. So let's say we'll take the first equation, and we're going to multiply the whole equation by a magic number. In this case, that magic number is minus 2, okay? And there's a reason why I'm doing minus 2. So instead of x plus 2y equals 3, I get minus 2x minus 4y equals minus 6. And the reason for that is that if I take that equation and I add it to the other one, and I'm talking term for term, add it up, the reason I picked minus 2 is because that turns this into minus 2x. The other expression had a positive 2x. And so when I add those terms out, I have eliminated the x term, hence the method of elimination. So most computers do elimination, like in the background, when you have these really, really large systems. So MATLAB, that's what MATLAB does. It does elimination. So uh, if you've ever um, utilized some, uh, at some point we will in this class utilize some, some more robust uh, matrix analysis software or finite element analysis software, that's what it's doing in the background. It's just elimination. So uh, we eliminate the x terms to get y equals 2, and then it's the same story. Plug that into one of the equations to get x is minus 1. Uh, and there we go. So those are probably the two methods that you did in high school or in algebra here at Marshall. Familiar? Okay. Now, the third method is to use matrix algebra. Okay? And what that means is that we're going to take this system and rewrite it in matrix form. Now, all that means is that, so we have x plus 2y equals 3, 2x plus 3y equals 4. The 3 and the 4 become a column of values. We call that a vector. The x and the y become a column of unknowns. And this square matrix, 1, 2, 2, and 3, come from the coefficients of the equations here. So 1, 2, 2, and 3. Uh, and so the idea is that in matrix uh, land, if I have this matrix times the unknowns equals b, so in matrix land we usually write that as like ax equals b. So the idea, if, if I want to find that unknown, I take the inverse of that matrix times b. So that's the idea, is to find the inverse of that matrix. So really the central challenge in linear algebra is to learn how to invert a matrix, or maybe more fundamentally, figure out whether or not a matrix is invertible to begin with uh, or not. But this isn't linear algebra, uh, but I can talk about linear algebra, so I'm blue with this. All right, so the idea is to find the inverse of this, this matrix. Now, the nice thing about uh, setting it up in this fashion is this is something that computers 
are set up to do very, very, very well. In fact, um, a lot of the more advanced structural analysis methods that are available to us are about taking structural analysis models and writing them in matrix form because computers can solve matrices very, very efficiently. Okay? Now, the downside is that matrix algebra is a tad laborious when it's done by hand. Uh, once you get beyond three by three systems, it just becomes monotonous. It's not difficult, it just becomes over and over and over again. But this is where calculators and, and computers come into play. Your scientific calculator, uh, I know the Casio will do this, will solve two by two systems and three by three systems on its own. Okay? Um, I have here the Casio, and I'm going to show you how to do this on the Casio. I actually have a playlist that I've developed that goes through a series of other calculators, like I see a TI-84, I see some other graphing calculators that will show you step-by-step step how to do this in other calculators. So that I'm going to focus on the Casio because I know that everybody has to have it for 111, but um, if you have another calculator, that's fine. We can probably uh, uh, work through how to do that. In the Casio, what you do is, um, you, the first thing you do is you hit the mode button, and the mode button will bring up the various uh, uh, operation modes for the calculator. Mode 1 is just general computations. That's what you tend to be using by default. Uh, but you're going to go into mode 5, which is the equation solver mode, and there's four options. Like the third option is the quadratic formula. The fourth option is the cubic formula. We're going to be looking at option 1 and option 2, and specifically for us in, in today, we're going to be looking at option 1, which is solving 2 by 2 systems. So what that happens is when you um, uh, uh, run the equation solver, uh, you get sort of a table that looks something like this, and you just populate this table with the appropriate coefficients uh, in your uh, system of equations. And what will happen is it will spit out x equals something, which is your first answer, and y equals something, which is your second answer. So you need to make sure that you're writing it systematically. Otherwise, I mean, the calculator doesn't know what you're naming variables or what, what you're ordering uh, things in and whatnot. So you just need to make sure that you're being systematic. With that, I want to actually go back to this example, and I want to show you how we can solve this joint using the method of joints, but it does require some, some matrix algebra uh, to do it. Okay, so let's go back to this example. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to look at this, um, this joint here, and, and uh, specifically what I want to start off by doing is I want to start off by looking at the slope ratios for these diagonal members and see if I can start defining these terms maybe a little bit more robustly or a little bit more uh, accurately. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to look... We're going to look at these slope ratios. So let's look at member AB. So member AB, uh, if you see, member AB is at a 1 to 1. So if this is 1 and this is 1, what's the hypotenuse? Square root of 2. All right, so would you agree with the following statement? Would you agree that AB X is to 1 as AB is to the square root of 2? Now that's a little different than what we've done before. What we've done before in the method of joints is we've never worried about the, uh, the diagonal here because our thought was, well, if we know the horizontal component, we can determine the vertical component just by using these numbers. But I'm trying to relate it to the hypotenuse, okay, because that's the real unknown. So would a fair statement be, therefore, ABX is 1 over the square root of 2AB? Would that be a fair statement? Now, I'm sure that there's somebody in here that went, my math teacher said we don't have radicals at the bottom. It should be square root of 2 over 2. That it, it's the same answer. So I'm sure the math department will hate me when I say that, but in the end, that works. <laughs> so, so ABY 
is to 1 also as AB is to the square root of 2. So ABY is 1 over the square root of 2 AB. Fair statement? All right, so I'm going to go ahead and do AC over here. So AC, now AC is different. Okay, so AC we have a triangle that looks like this. This is 1, 2. What's the hypotenuse in this instance? That's 1 and 2. What's that? Square root of 5. All right. So ACX is to 2 as AC is the square root of whoop, to the square root of 5. Is, is that a fair statement? Whereas ACY is to 1 as AC is to the square root of 5, right? So ACX is 2 over the square root of 5 AC ACY is 1 over the square root of 5 AC. Do y'all see how I did that? <clears throat> is there a significant uh, advantage of doing it this way rather than just calculating the angle using sign of this one? No, but this is shorter, I think. I, I, I personally think this is less keystrokes in the calculator. On the calculator, okay. I mean, I'm not. I haven't touched my calculator to do this right. not once. That's that's kind of why. But let me also say this: what you're talking about is not wrong. Right. But what is this fraction? This fraction is the cosine of that angle. Right. This is the sine of that angle. Right. So because it's opposite over hypotenuse and adjacent over hypotenuse, if you feel more comfortable doing that, that is completely and 100 percent totally fine. So. But I'm lazy. That's why. I just didn't know if there's like. This is way better for maybe more complex situations or something like that. Mm, not really. I, I don't. I, I just. I, I. think it's. It. It's. Uh, uh, results in less calculator strokes. That's kind of why. Yeah. Is everybody okay with this? This is good stuff. Okay. So now, now let's go about actually doing this joint analysis. So now that we've kind of got this figured out. So. So. Method of joints at A. Now, um, with this problem, I um, I don't think, especially, so look at the truss, okay? So the truss, we have loads going all over the place. We've got members, uh, we have two diagonals. Personally, I don't think that I'm good enough to look at this and go, of course that member's in tension, or of course that member's in compression. So especially given the fact that I'm going to be uh, relying a little heavier on matrix algebra to solve the problem, I'm going to go ahead and make a blanket assumption that both members are in tension. Okay, And I'm doing that because if my calculator or if my calcu computations yields a positive answer, then that assumption was correct. If I get a negative answer, it doesn't mean I need to develop significant emotional stress. It just means the elements in compression. The other point worth mentioning is that we are going to start breaking out some uh, um, finite element software to analyze some structures later, and it doesn't know any better. It, it the, the way that those uh, software packages operate. You just build your model, and it gives you the answer. And so you as the analyst need to go, well, that's negative. That's compression. And so you, I think we need to start introducing that mode of thinking now. So, so let's look at our joint. Let's go back to what we had before. So we had a joint like this and a joint like this. We had 40 hips. We had... This was 25 kips. And now I'm going to call this A, B, Y, A, B, X, 
A C Y A C X. Okay, because I've already I've already handled the slope ratio aspects of this. I've already taken care of that. Okay. So that's what's going on with this joint. So maybe let's start off by summing forces in the x direction. So, and I'm going to be kind of formal about it this time, because this is our first time kind of handling joints this way. So, what do I have going to the left? I have 40 kips, right? And what do I have going to the right? So, I have ABX and I have ACX. But didn't I already come up with other ways to rewrite these? Didn't I already say that ABX is 1 over the square root of 2AB and this is 2 over the square root of 5AC? So shouldn't I go ahead and just substitute that now? So what I've got is 40 kips equals this. And I'm going to call this equation 1. Now let's do the verticals. forces going up. I have 25 kips going up. I have ABY going up, but I know that that's 1 over the square root of 2 AB. And I have ACY going up, but I know that's 1 over the square root of 5 <coughs> AC. So I would argue that probably the most important aspect of this type of analysis is just to be accurate with your bookkeeping. Like say I have 2 over the square root of 5 here, but I have 1 over the square root of 5 here. Just make sure that you don't transpose digits uh, and whatnot. So I have 25 kips plus 1 over the square root of 2 AB plus 1 over the square root of 5 AC is zero, or maybe I'll rewrite that as uh, one over the square root of two AB plus one over the square root of five AC is negative 25 kips. We'll call this equation two. Let me stop for a second and see. I know this is, it shouldn't be all that different, but we are arranging it a little differently than we have before. Is everybody okay with this? Okay. All right, so let's take these expressions and let's arrange them a little differently. Okay, so let's solve these. So, so we've got equation one is, and I'm going to rewrite it a little bit. I'm going to just swap, swap it around. I'm going to say one over the square root of two AB 
plus 2 over the square root of 5 AC is 40 kips. And then equation 2, I'm just going to write it as is. So if I were to rewrite this sort of in matrix terminology, what I would be doing is I would be writing it like this. So first off, I write all of my coefficients. Next, I write my unknowns, and look at the order that I'm writing them in. Notice I've got A, B, then A, C. So I've got A, B, then AC, and that equals 40, negative 25. Now, over here, this is sort of like how the Casio, how it would work in the Casio. Your calculator might be a little different, but for the Casio, So you're going to go to mode, five, one, and then you will get a table, and all you do is you enter in these values. So you, you have, it'll probably be something like this, like A, B, C, one, and two, and so you just enter one over the square root of two, one over the square root of two, two over the square root of five. 1 over the square root of 5, 40, and then negative 25. And then what will happen is you will get a set of answers. You'll get x equals something and y equals something. Dependent upon what calculator you have, you might have a different way of going about it. Um, I think that the TI-36X, the process is very, very similar. For those of you that have graphing calculators, you might have to actually define these matrices and take the inverse of this and multiply it by that. Some of those cal uh, uh, graphing calculators have baked into them uh, equation solution, but um, some of them just like, for example, I'm a TI-89 user and I honestly think it's easier to just take the inverse of this and multiply it by that in a TI-89, but that, that's me. So, For those of you that have uh, already done this, um, what do you get for your um, what do you get for your system here? So what do you get for X and Y? I got negative 127.28. Negative 127.28. And what about a Y? 145.34. 145. Like I didn't want to write that down. Oh, there, yeah. That's fine. Did, did everybody else getting that? So what you're getting here are not the X and Y components. You're getting the overall magnitude, the overall resultant, okay? And let's look at the order. The calculator doesn't know any better. It doesn't know. So that's why we were very diligent in writing it in a given order, the AB, then the AC, the AB, then the AC. So I propose that AB is... negative 127.28 kips, but what does the negative mean? It's in compression. It's in compression. That's why at the beginning we just assume everything is tension, so if we get a negative answer, we know it's in compression. So 127.28 kips in compression. And then AC is positive 145.34 kips or 145.34 kips in tension. And there you go. So it, just so everybody is clear, how would I continue this problem if I were solving the whole truss out? Well, if I have AB, I can determine ABX and ABY. And if I have AC, I can determine ACX and ACY. 
What I could do is just keep on going with the trust. I could solve joint B or joint C or joint D or whatnot. The only reason for breaking out the matrix algebra is because I have a joint with two diagonals. Okay? The, remaining tr the, the, rema the rest of the trust I can probably get by without having to do this. Because if I go, if I scroll up, I'm going to scroll up for a little bit and I'll come back down. But if I look at, let's say, joint, I don't know, B or C, so I've solved this member and this member, I could probably solve, let's say, joint C without having to exploit any matrix algebra, right? Because I have a vertical and a diagonal. Same thing here, a vertical and a diagonal. I just don't worry about it, right? Don't have, I don't have to do this matrix algebra. If I really, really like matrix algebra, I could do joint B, get this member and this member, and then just, I don't know, solve joint C and get the last one. Make sense? So I don't want you to see that and think that's impossible. We can't solve it just because there's two diagonals. It's just a little bit more uh, uh, math to do. Sound good? Okay. All right. I've got one other thing I want to talk about today, um, which is the identification of zero force members. This is one of those things that I could very easily skip in this class. But I'm sorry, I, I'm all about providing you tools in your tool belt, and this is just a really good skill to have. But before we get into that, are there any other questions about this? Okay. All right, so let's talk about zero force members, okay? So, did I not put this up? Okay, there we go. All right, so let's talk about zero force members. Now, when we did the trust in class last time, we arrived at a trust that the answer, one of the members, the internal force inside that member was zero, right? And that happens, okay? Now the very first question that I got from one of the students in here is why bother having a trust member that has zero loaded? Now, I could give you the, the, the cheap answer, which is that if I had removed that member from the trust, I would be generating a trust that is unstable, right? That, and that's true. For that trust, if that member would be gone, the trust would be unstable. But let's be honest, we could probably configure the trust under that load condition to where we didn't have any zero force members. So that, that gets around the question. So let me answer it uh, uh, more generally. Why do you even have zero force members to begin with? Okay. The more practical reason is that instead of carrying load, they may serve as braces. So if you have an element that's in compression, things in compression like to buckle. So having a member framing into one of those compression elements, can act, that member can act as a brace and, and serve to strengthen that member in compression. So even if it's not meant to carry load, it might act as a brace for an element in compression. That is a very real reason why you would include a zero force member. I had worked on trusses where there were trust members that were zero force members, but they were sized not to carry load, but to serve as braces for the elements in compression. Okay, that, that's one reason. The other reason is we are only dealing or, or making a determination that it is a zero force member based on a specific set of loads. What if those loads move? What if I'm dealing with a different load case? Uh, very, very, very soon, we're going to be looking at trust deflections, and trust deflections are going to require us to solve a trust twice. And under one load condition, you might have a member that's carrying force, and under another load condition, it might not be carrying any at all. So just because it, it's a zero force member in one load scenario doesn't mean it will be in all load scenarios. Um, so just because, it, so, so again, I, I think I've made the point there. Uh, I just want you to recognize that zero force members are going to pop up for more reasons than, other, uh, than others. Now, identifying and being able to spot which elements are zero force members can make your life a lot easier uh, when, when solving a trust. For example, see this trust right here? Zero, 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 zero. Without doing any math, I can tell you that every one of those members is a zero force member. Every one of them. Okay? Doesn't that make your life a little easier? without having to do, do any of the trust analysis, being able to just spot check and see. Now, I'm sure some of you are looking at me like, how'd you do that? Beyond just pulling an image from the book that happened to have the zeros already printed on it. Um, there are three rules that you can follow on a joint-by-joint -joint basis to identify zero-force members. 
technically there are two, but I've taken one of them and sort of split it up into two rules because I think it's easier to follow. But I want you to go along with me on this. So let's talk about rule number one. Rule number one is the rule that I'm calling no load applied at the joint. Okay, and what this rule states is that uh, if you have a joint that's got two members with unknown internal forces, the members can't be collinear. Okay, they got to be like at, at different angles. And there's no loads applied to that joint. They're both zero force members. Now, let me be clear. Um, this is, I, I don't think I'm really doing anything that's all that magical. Okay? This is just using the equations of equilibrium and applying some common sense um, rules to it. As an example. Okay? So, he, let's take a look at this joint over here on the right. So, I have a horizontal... And I have a diagonal which splits up into a vertical and a horizontal. So let's just look at this joint right here. So how many unknowns do I have in the horizontal direction? Two. Vertical, I have one, right? So if I sum forces in the vertical direction, what is that? Zero. If this is zero, that's zero, right? And now I only have one unknown horizontal and there's no forces in the x direction, that's got to be zero. Right? That's it. That's all that first rule states. Is that if I have two members basically out in space with no external loads applied, those two members are zero force members. And to be clear, that also holds true if you had, let's say, a joint that had four members framing into it, but you had already figured out that these were zero force members, then these two have to be zero force members uh, as well. Make sense? All right, that's rule one. Let's look at rule two. Let's look at rule two. Here's rule two. Rule two, I'm calling two members, but I'm saying collinear loads. Okay? So here's what's going on with two members and collinear loads. And the best place to look is right here at this joint here at the bottom. So this can happen very often in a truss analysis. So I have Let's say a cantilever truss, I got a roller support, so it's got a reaction right here, and then I got a member right here and a member right here. So sum of forces in the x direction tells me that if I've got a force here going to the right, I've got to have a force here going to the left. But what about sum of verticals? There's nothing in this member, right? So this is a zero force member. If I have two members where I don't know the internal forces, but I have an applied load that's parallel to one of the members, so like Right here, I've got a joint, two members. I've got a load that's parallel to one of them. This member's carrying that load. This member's a zero force member. Does that make sense? And again, this di diagonal has a vertical and a horizontal component. So the vertical component's got to be zero, which means the horizontal component's got to be zero. Same thing down here. The same story applies. So if, uh, if I've got four members framing into a joint, but I've already figured out these two are zero force members, then the same rule would apply. This load is collinear with that load, same magnitude, that zero. Make sense? Okay. Now what about rule three? Rule three is kind of an extension of rule two. So rule three states that if I have three members framing into a joint, two of those members are parallel or collinear, but this one isn't, and there's no load applied at the joint. These two are the same. This is zero. Now, I want to be crystal clear. This rule goes kapui if I put a load at this joint. Okay. If I were to place a load, like a downward load right here, then this is not a zero force member. It's got to pick up some of that load. Okay. But if there's no load applied to that joint, these two are going to be the same. That's going to be zero. And it doesn't matter which way they face, like here. This force equals that force, that zero. Th does that make sense? The two collinear uh, uh, members will always carry equal loads. The third will be a zero force member. Let's look at this. Okay, and I think I put this here in the notebook. Now, to be clear, I've actually given you the answer to this one, but I kind of want to take some time and investigate this. So... We're going to identify by observation the zero force members in this truss. And I, I will grant you, this is a weird truss. 
But um, I just want you to see how much math we can do or how much determination we can make without doing a single calculation. Now, I will tell you there are five zero force members in this truss. Okay? Now, the best way of identifying a zero force member is to do this on a joint by joint basis. Okay? Now, I'm curious. I want to pick your brains a little bit. Is there a joint that you think we ought to start looking at based on the three rules I just mentioned? What's that? H. Okay, H. Let's look at H. Okay, why are you telling me to look at H? I was the three member rule that we just talked about. The, There's no external So we have joint H. Now notice one of the things I said. All the diagonal members are at a one-to-one -one slope ratio, which means that this member and this member are parallel, they're collinear. So if these two members are collinear and this member isn't, what does that tell me? Is there a zero force member that frames in at H? And which one? HP. HP. That's a zero force member. So I'm going to highlight this. I'm going to say this. Oh, can you help if I turn my pen on? That is a zero force member. That's 100% right. So we looked at joint H. Is there another joint that we ought to look at right now? G. G. Okay. So, tell me what's going on with G. What's, why'd you say G? Falls into that second rule. Falls into that second rule. And that second rule states this is a roller, so there is potentially a reaction that goes right here. So, if there's a reaction that goes right here, this member carries that load, so which is the zero force member? GA. GA, the, the vertical member right there. That's the zero force member. Anybody see another joint we ought to look at? Say it again. Well, we can look at E, but E has three members framing into it. I'm trying to think of a simpler joint. What's that? D. D. Let's look at joint D. Joint D is out here in space and there's nothing on it. I've got two members. What does rule one say? Two unknown members, no loads applied at the joint. I propose both of these are zero force members. This is a zero force member. That's a zero force member. There's nothing on it. It's just, honestly, somebody just put some stuff out there, like they had the trust built, and they said, let's just put a couple other members out there, but there's nothing on it. Now, is there another joint that we ought to look at? There's one more we ought to look at right now. I'll give you a hint, it's already been said. What's that? E. E. What's going on with joint E? Now remember, this is a zero force member, so we can ignore this member. Now tell me what's going on with joint E. How many unknowns are framed into joint E? Well, two, I mean, but this is collinear, right? This load is collinear with, with member CE, so what does that tell me? That's a zero force member. Now, let's, let's extend this a little bit, just to be clear. Are these two zero force members? Not necessarily, because this member's carrying load, right? Okay, so we have two joints. We have a load applied to that. We can't say these two are zero force members. That's definitely not a zero force member. That's definitely not a zero force member, right? We've got a horizontal and vertical reaction applied here, so we can't say these two are zero force members. So I think we're probably done there. Okay. But wasn't that crazy how we didn't even do any math and we already solved five members in the trust? The other thing that we can do is how much force is in this member? 
50 kips in tension, right? This member is carrying whatever that reaction is. No math. It's kind of crazy. Yes, sir. So what is your reaction at A, uh, the downward for the support? Ah, so you're saying why Why does, so, so this, that's a good question. So what you're saying is that this member is going to have a reaction, right? So you're saying how come none of that's going into that vertical? Yeah. The simple answer is because it's going into this. Right? Okay. Right? Now, you could ask the question, well, what if this diagonal wasn't there? Would it go into that vertical? Well, theoretically, but if we started removing members, the truss would be unsafe. So that it's sort of like a, well, what if, but that what if couldn't really happen. You see what I mean? If we start going down that road, then the truss would have a different configuration altogether, right? And then we'd be looking at a different problem. And in that different problem, we'd be making different conclusions anyways. So we saw five members, well, seven members really, because we have those five zero force members. We know those two, uh, the forces in those two members, and we didn't do any calculations at all. Pretty, pretty slick, isn't it? For deflections and for your analysis project, this skill will help. Just tell me. All right. Let me make sure, because I had this solved out. It would be pretty embarrassing if I missed one. I don't think I did. Yep, I got all of them. Okay. Um, any questions? All right. So I've given you a homework assignment that uh, is all about the two by two equation solving. Uh, if you understand that, that homework assignment is going to be a breeze. We have one more assignment dedicated specifically to trusses, truss and uh, force analysis, and that's the method of sections homework. Then we're going to get into deflection lane. I will tell you that the lecture on Friday is going to be different. But I have snapshots of Mario and Link in that lecture. I know, I'm a door. All right, I'm getting three minutes of your life back. That's all I got. I will see you all on Wednesday.